Bien, ahora sí empezamos. Buenas tardes con todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us. My name is Sandra Reyes and I'm part uh, of uh, LACNIC's training group. We're going to start uh, this webinar. But uh, before doing that, I'm going to give some housekeeping announcements for those of you who are coming for the first time before we uh, give the floor to our guest. It's going to this webinar is going to take uh, um, an hour, 60 minutes. We are going to have some more tenuous interpretations. The original language will be Spanish, but you can choose uh, the other two languages as you please. And during the webinar, we're going to have a uh, um, the opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end, uh, please write them down in the Q&A panel that you have in the uh, on the toolbar at the bottom of, of the page. We're going to be recording this and in the future we're going to send you the link so that you can play it again. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Alessia Zucchetti, who's uh, um, also from LACNIC. She'll welcome you and uh, she'll present uh, Javiera Atenas, who's uh, our panelist today. Go ahead, Alessia. Thank you, Sandra. Good afternoon. Welcome uh, everybody to this webinar. Capacities for a datafied society, how to understand the impact of uh, data from a critical perspective. This webinar is held uh, under the uh, framework of a women in technology uh, promoted by LACNIC um, that uh, discusses the current uh, relevant issues, emphasizing the challenges uh, that uh, hinder the participation of women in the ecosystem and the community of the internet and uh, in um, the fields of uh, technology in general. Today, Specifically, we're going to uh, discuss uh, identification and uh, the cur in the current society and in the future, introducing some elements that may help us understand the impact of uh, data in our on our daily life and uh, the skills that have become indispensable in uh, this setting. We have um, today Javiera Atenas, uh, a professor of education and a professor of the University of uh, Sample in uh, the UK. And she is principal investigator of LIDA, the uh, Latin American Initiative for Open Data and senior fellow of the British Academy of Superior Education. Javiera has a long teaching uh, history and uh, in research, uh, opening research. She has worked in Europe, um, Latin America, and, and the Middle East, uh, giving advice to governments, uh, international agencies, and universities on policy and curricular development in education, science, and open data. And at present, she's collaborating with, the, with UNESCO, developing uh, open education uh, topics. We uh, welcome uh, Javiera, and we thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, Alessia. Thank you, Clara, Sandra, and uh, the entire team of LACNIC. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start talking. The idea is uh, to have a talk and not just my talk. And what I intend to do today is to share my experience in capacity building. So I work on public policy, data and education, but this is rather an approach to reflection and it's an invitation to think of the capacities we need as uh, citizens, as uh, people, to be able to interact uh, with uh, the environment uh, in a democratically in a society that is highly datified, because we have to understand the impact of data in our lives, our societies, and uh, our spaces, but from a critical perspective. My working team, well, there, there are three of us, uh, myself and Haberman and Kikiabo, and uh, we um, discuss a key, a key thing, and that is that the piece, the datum, the piece of information is not neutral. It's never neutral. As a matter of fact, it's a political tool. Therefore, the data and the algorithms used uh, to analyze them may 
and uh, uh, if they're not controlled, it may cause stigmatization, segregation, discrimination, because the, why isn't uh, a piece of information neutral? Because in order to collect uh, data, we ask a question. The data are not generated spontaneously. We would like that to happen, but that's not the case. There is a question behind it. What uh, data should I open? Why do I open it? Who's asking for it? Why am I opening? Why do I need the data? What's the problem that I'm going to address uh, with uh, this uh, 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 with the data? And with the open data, that's the easiest uh, ecosystem to understand in society, because uh, um, in addition to personal data, it's that's what we can reach more easily. There are political decisions that lead us to open different uh, data, such as prioritization. When we work with AGESIC, for instance, I work with uh, the Uruguayan groups, with the University of the Republic, um, and with AGESIC. Um, and uh, but uh, the conversations we have to open a lot of data so what should i open that element that question already removed neutrality and therefore what do we do we we have prejudice it's never raw it's never neutral so I think that uh, here we can start something more complex. Uh, so what is uh, datification? What do we understand by this concept? Those of us that are older than 40, we remember when we went to the university and we talked about uh, information society. Manuel Castell and uh, the um, information society, information is power, data is power, and all of a sudden that uh, discourse uh, was not, uh, uh, was no longer heard. And after the pandemic, we, the, we no longer talk of uh, information society. It's like uh, Queen Elizabeth's era, era. It's, this is a new era. It's uh, the datified um, society. So when we think of uh, the information society, as Castelli said, information provides power and disseminating uh, information gives us power and powering society through information gives power, but information gradually got reduced into the key element, but it, uh, it exponentially grew as databases. So therefore, we went from uh, uh, information um, uh, theories of information to big data, and we skipped a very inter an intermediate thing, and uh, so uh, uh, and all of a sudden, big data is power and it is control. So when we start thinking of the datified society, everything it's, it's a society where everything gets written as a piece of information as data. I'm a datum of many things. I'm a, an electoral data and um, uh, economic data a reproductive data i have children i don't have children i work i don't work i work full time i don't work full time am i the owner of a house or not and so i'm just uh, an entry through in uh, different databases so and they want to know how this uh, the uh, things get restructured so uh, based on our interactions with different platforms and the social media. That's not the same as interacting with uh, systems. The corporations and the governments uh, make decisions based on the data provided by society. For instance, the data may have a broad range of activities. The economic uh, impact, for instance, Whenever you search for something in the format, then you are bombarded with uh, publicity and the public policy. There's um, what is it that uh, public policy is informing us? Uh, the crucial element that is uh, uh, feeding uh, policies is data. And uh, those of us who have uh, streaming platforms for uh, um, uh, uh, such as uh, Netflix, they study what we see, they study our emotions, they may look for uh, 
whether you you like to watch uh, romance or crime or something is happening with the conductor study based on what people see so the audiovisual platforms are providing information on your physical space and your sentimental space as well and obviously your interaction with the social media what are the um, uh, political elements of those people what is our bubble thinking of uh, an information bubble what do we understand by identification basically the translation the it's the it describes the structural translation of our uh, uh, daily interactions and activities in uh, tabulated information that are available for analysis process you get you wait up, you respond, you answer WhatsApp messages, uh, you see what's missing in the to-do list, uh, or the, uh, the and uh, you prepare a cup of coffee, and uh, you go to, you take a bus, and uh, they keep a record of where you uh, took the bus, and then uh, you check uh, the girl, your child's app to see what she ate, and then you check your mail, and you're constantly interacting with platforms. So everything turns into uh, data. So the datification in a more social uh, political context are practices that should lead us to challenge our relations with social solidarity, privacy, security, uh, civic participation, and our sovereignty. It's the sovereignty of our data. For instance, all uh, the uh, in the indigenous communities may have, uh, have the right to uh, provide data or not to. So I draw data because people usually, uh, um, Catherine de Ignacio, for instance, says, who's the author of the book Feminism Data, we always use a language that is extractive. We mine, we exploit, uh, we remove so it's but we are speaking of information of people and societies and the concept of sovereignty has to do with what i as a community i, I wanted to protect my information so that you won't be drawn uh, dna without your authorization and uh, allowing you not to have uh, information drawn from your uh, society so that without your authorization so that has to do with the way the platforms change the paradigms in a society the transformations that the platforms like uber have and airbnb Uber has changed the public policy of uh, taxi licenses in many countries, and it has even changed the labor policies in the countries because it's the largest taxi company in the world. They have no taxes, but they have information about the movement and the, the trips of uh, millions and millions of users. They have the profiles of, of those users. They know where they are, where they live, what they buy, they know what they receive, what they send, and they have led to changes. For instance, who can uh, drive a taxi in the past? Uh, uh, a taxi driver in London had to study for three years. Now they just download the app, and and it's very easy. People complain that they don't uh, um, abide by the labor law, etc. So the people that work in the platform that are a data for a piece of data for the platforms do. Now, what do we do with all that information? What do I do as a citizen, as a, a member of uh, the uh, academia, and as a citizen especially, how do I relate with all the data? And I think that if we look at um, the 12 points or, or five points, during the pandemic, we saw so many charts. Close your eyes and think of all the information, all the statistics that you received, the five or seven months of the pandemic that you were not even capable of understanding. Thousands and millions of da um, data, death, uh, contagion, and they didn't come through one single platform. It was on TV, on the phone, every 
you would be warned with your app that you had been in contact with someone with a um, uh, COVID. So let's start from the most uh, the easiest thing to read a chart. Tremendos ejemplos de manipulación política a través de gráficos mal hecho. Por lo tanto, so there's a lot of political manipulation with graphs are not properly prepared. So in addition to being to read, understand and read statistics, this is also related to how to participate actively in a datified society. Now, what are the skills that you need in higher education so that people can work with data, but in addition to the technical aspects of where do I store the data, or if you used uh, one or the other system for storing this, we have to understand the social component. So, understanding the data from the standpoint of the data ethics. So we think about the key challenge I'm involved in because this is my daily work. This is thinking about cross-cutting data literacy that starts right from the early years at school. Why do I have to start training children right from school age on data-related issues? Because basically, there is another gap for people who like this topic. There's always a new gap. We have a digital gap, the gender gap. Now we have the data gap. So people who don't understand anything about data cannot participate in such a datified society, and they cannot challenge the dynamics of power. So Foucault and Giroud, society cannot be critical of what is happening if they don't understand how this is happening. So we think about public policies and we think about the entire triangle, all the lobby around public policies so that this gets derailed is done behind closed doors. And these policies are shaped through data. And if people cannot even participate in that conversation, why is this being decided? Why is this other thing being decided? Then the triangle becomes even larger and almost impenetrable. So only the people who can understand data are those who will be able to do lobbying for public policy purposes. So a space is created, a very high barrier is set. This is like a glass ceiling, which is impossible to cross unless you have the skills required to have technical and social political conversations around data. So the promise of citizenship and democratic participation and all things we hear in the democratic countries, how can this be done unless you understand the databases that are required and used to demonstrate that you're, that you're right? So Johnson, who has studied the issue of information justice, says that open data on their own cannot promote social justice. And what is more, they can even marginalize those who cannot interact with data in an effective manner and make them into objects of study. And I think that in the context of Latin America, there is a quote by Le Luthier who says, those who are born ugly and poor have high chances of dying as ugly and poor. So in these societies, you end up being an object of study in just one point on the map. And this is enormous risk for our society because we will discriminate and marginalize those people looking at them from above and studying them when, in fact, when we speak about participation and participation in society and citizens' uh, science and so on, we are speaking about spaces where we learn from the communities and we report what we learn to the community, scientific communities. So then these can be translated into things that are, can be applied. To. But if we go back to the British anthropological model of the 1800s, we'll be looking at the most vulnerable people, vulnerable people 
as if, well, these are my data. No, they are individuals and all these individuals have a history. And that is the risk of not being able to work with the data from a critical standpoint, because you can be quite a genius managing statistics and statistical analysis. But if you don't look at data as human beings being behind that data, then the level of doing things wrongly can expose people to have a very to having a very negative impact in their lives it happened with my colleagues when we had to collect data for a project in middle east i worked with a british team and they said well we have to collect data on gender the team was made up this was with the people we were working with so they were all university professors from Morocco, from Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine. And one of the colleagues said, we have to collect gender data. Yes, great. We're going to have two genders. No, well, the guide in my university says that we have to reflect other options. I say, great, that is what the protocol establishes over here. But the thing is that we are collecting from data from groups over there, and nobody can declare that you have another gender or another option with that is subject to death penalty. So if they manage to identify that this small project, which were 20 professors for each university and X number of universities for each country, they can figure this out very rapidly. And you don't know what the consequences will be for an individual. So we have to put the person before data collection. This um, led me to a great uh, argument, but nevertheless, that's what we're here for. So the fact of saying that people come before data, the community come before data, and this has to do with the concept of data justice. And in the case of this research, and this is what is being promoted by data justice, is promoting the examination between social justice and datification. We have to place people in the at the forefront and the public policies resulting from the data have to be based on data and big data processes. So data anonymization, well, this does not exist at all. So they start identifying populations you can see what this refers to. So you have to identify small minority groups because these have qualities that are very specific. Metadata can be the whistleblower. You can determine who did this. So thinking about this, thinking about the concept of data justice and algorithms, all this is fed into the machine. So what do we want to have all this data? Well, this is machine learning. Let us feed the machine with all this data, data from the platform, social data, data from the census, data collected by the government. So we have to understand the ethical connotations. We're going to feed an algorithm, which we don't know, but we're going to feed an algorithm. So basically, all this information collected will be used to feed in the algorithm. And this is with the internet cookies. So the algorithm is like a black box. And when these are social algorithms, the algorithms used by the government, people have to be entitled to examine this because the algorithm is not a spontaneous generation. This occurs in a laboratory in a specific environment. So all the prejudices are present in the algorithm. UNESCO promotes that citizens should have space to develop the awareness, to participate in democratic discussions, to prevent the misuse of intelligence, artificial intelligence. But this is a kind of a macro concept. So how can we make the citizens understand these issues and the awareness 
resulting from this and how can they challenge the structures of power? So we go back to Paolo Freire's concept and education for what purpose? These are some examples. Racism and algorithms. If we look back and set a context in history, IBM was a, one of the first machines ever to generate computing come from a specific country, namely United States. And United States had a policy called redlining. Redlining means where certain people can or cannot live, particularly Afro-descendants. She says something went wrong with the pointer. So the geographical institution from where this population came to the United States when the computing systems began to be implemented, the first automated computing, it had to do with redlining. Where did these Afro-descendants live? And this, so this determined where you could buy houses, what schools you could go to. So this showed you how these data were created. interracial marriages were banned until 1950s. So when the decisions began to be automated, this was then based on spaces. For example, who can apply for a loan? The banks are the first to use this for decision-making. So people living in the red-lined districts, if at all, the loans were granted at a much higher interest rate compared to someone living in a white neighborhood. And this happens until today, because this is something that happens today. So people from certain computer froze for a second. So these things affect the safety of your neighborhood. For example, the criminality, this criminal information and criminality in certain neighborhoods. So if you live in N1, that's where the rich people live. But if you live, that's where Boris Johnson used to live in, for example, in London. So my car insurance was much more expensive because my neighborhood, even though it were this was the same community, there was a higher criminality rate compared to the other neighborhood. So how do I know that? Well, because I started to play around with the data and wanted to understand why my car insurance was that expensive. Now, everything has been turned into algorithms. Many processes occur through machines. And this is the, for example, having a visa. Why don't you get a visa, for example? Why don't you get a visa to travel to Canada or to United States? Probably you are in a zone where the machine that does the screening just doesn't like it. This is extrapolated also to education. When you speak about learning analytics, learning analytics already contains a bias. We know that there are vulnerable populations that perform less at school. So this type of analysis affects those children directly. And there are even worse things. You have case of facial recognition at school or also greater predictive policing in given neighborhoods. So machine says that if you're poor and ugly, it's likely that you'll be uh, also a, a, a criminal. So, for example, people who belong to certain social groups and vulnerable groups will have longer sentences. So, 
So this depends on your origin, if you're an Afro-descendant or if you are belong to an original population. And then also regarding sexism, there's a very strong component in data. Now, who creates the machine? Who feeds the machine? 78% of all professionals on AI are men. And this is not personal, but there are a whole set of prejudices that are incorporated into these algorithms. Therefore, women, in terms of applying for a job and when screening is done in a machine, they accept uh, many more um, men than women, even if the women are more highly um, educated, because we are at higher risk for companies. We pay more insurance, more in access to the other week, have a worse access to market, and it's because and. Uh, the algorithm fails in the diagnosis of a health of women because the machine is coded. The infection is the most uh, typical thing because uh, when you have access to machines, the algorithm will decide that uh, that is not an infection because it has to be the problem if you uh, have uh, certain symptoms. And uh, that is what happens, uh, for instance, uh, to men, because among women, the infection has other symptoms, so uh, the, uh, the um, uh, algorithm won't detect it. So uh, this has an impact on uh, health of the economy and the family. Now, the law should be transparent, and the algorithms, um, especially of uh, uh, government uh, jobs, uh, need uh, to be uh, the there's a university in Chile where they have a center where they conduct uh, this uh, sort of surveillance of uh, algorithms in order to understand how to curb uh, or how to stop uh, the unfair processes. Of course, we have the socioeconomic uh, um, uh, discrimination, something that uh, the, the an old uh, government in Chile thought of uh, doing biometric cards so that uh, the pre and uh, the preschoolers could have an access uh, to the uh, school lunches. So even from uh, the moment that they are birth, uh, they are going to be discriminated. So if they, in order for them to have a, a scholarship, they need to have their biometric uh, data. Now, or uh, receiving uh, the, the automation of automation of poverty. I can uh, remove benefits from you depending on what the machine is uh, telling me. I don't like to hear it, but in the Netherlands, there is quite a significant case of uh, women who received uh, public benefits because of the poverty, and then they were accused of uh, fraud. And many of these people, or some of these people, kill themselves. That can be uh, the impact uh, of, uh, our, of uh, the algorithms. And as we as citizens cannot uh, um, uh, uh, control what the government is doing. We should be able to uh, uh, stop them or to curb. And that's what we speak of when we speak of agency. We need to put an end to those inequalities due to algorithms. Of course, we have political manipulation. That is the clearest example that we have seen how the data enter your data bubble and they manipulate your um, uh, policy, your, your political uh, views to the to the right or um, and. Uh, there is, so there is a bubble of uh, data because the algorithm reads uh, your interactions with uh, your opinion bubbles, your social and digital bubbles, and they uh, cause radicalization. And, and that was the work of ISIS to radicalize uh, um, the youth in Europe. So they, they get the information of where the mosques are and infiltrate social media and basically to draw data that will enable them to uh, fill uh, their brains 
with the uh, rubbish. So the, the we've seen it uh, in Brazil, in Chile, in Uruguay, in the United States. We've seen how manipulation through the huge campaigns that that are driven by bots change the political processes. So as uh, citizens and we need to think of uh, implementing regulatory frameworks uh, to uh, for the algorithms used in political campaign. So the, I don't have the solution. If I had it, I would already have a Norris Causa, and I study this uh, with my colleagues, with my research colleagues of the university and uh, our research groups. Now, how can we promote agency, not just for people to understand the data better, but we want them to improve their agency so that they may challenge unfair decisions. How can we make our students understand how recapitulation and the processing of the data provide power to some and remove it from others, and it creates um, an unbalance in society? I work with uh, Haverman and Timmerman, with Theo and uh, Christian is to avoid the most vulnerable collective groups uh, from uh, uh, being re uh, taken their agency on the data and the capability to have the data of the community. So when you are training uh, people on uh, data, we have it to speak of contest contestability. How am I going to enter the processes. So it, the OGP conducts a very important job and open government uh, partnership engages the citizens in digital democracy process that are data-based to guarantee the uh, existing mechanisms that may enable people not just to challenge how data is produced, but also they to provide them an active voice on decisions related to data. So with this, I would uh, like to close my, uh, my speech and maybe I'd like to discuss with where we want to be uh, in five years time, what is missing, uh, who is missing, and now what can we do? Thank you. Thank you, Javiera. Now, Alessia has the floor. So, Oh, Clara Cremona. Let me see if Clara has any questions for you. Thank you, Sandra. Yes, we do have a questions in the Q&A panel. It's an anonymous attendee uh, who's not giving the name uh, and says, thank you. How can we implement uh, data justice? Well, there's a whole lab at the university trying to respond to this question. It has to do with two areas, with capacity, and we need the academia to have a say in public policy, and it has to do with processes. We have to invite it, we have to uh, um, increase the skills of people at all ages. I love the program monitored by the Italians. They a monitor the civic where they invite friends, uh, groups of men, of women to participate in uh, the uh, data analysis to report um, the small uh, journal, the small newspaper of the uh, Calgary uh, uh, municipality so because they are not spending the money that uh, the European Union is spending, is giving them. Uh, it's not being well spent. And I think that those spaces enable people to start to understand the inequality of data when uh, they do not have uh, your say in discussions. I'm looking at questions. Thank you, Javiera. I'll read the next question. In the public policy field, um, is it unavoidable to data by uh, citizens to provide better public services and social provision? Uh, and uh, how can you do it with a human rights approach? The question is by Augusto Maturina. Augusto, I don't think it's unavoidable. It's, it's, uh, it's 
the idea is, well, gathering data transparently, for instance, sharing your methodology, putting it so that everybody can see it, describing how you're going to discuss things with the communities, how you're going to provide the public uh, services, and that have the people give you the data. Data should be an element for dialogue, and not just an abstraction where the government comes and gets the data. And they say, well, yes, you put a bus, but I don't need it at that time. I had to take uh, my child school on a bus or on the car. And so the idea is to discuss what is of use for us, how do we do it, and to have a space of cooperation to communities to want to improve the because they may change the, the times of buses because uh, they uh, get the information wrong. Many people take the 10 a.m. bus. And, uh, uh, no, you, you have to listen to the different communities. Thank you, Javier. So what is missing? We still have to promote women in a technological career. So we there are very good efforts, but they are still insufficient. I was invited to Cecilia Ortman's thesis and look for her because she's working on techno activism to take um, um, to non-formal um, uh, training, for instance, women that come from the uh, IT area, from engineering, to provide them these spaces for training and education from the point of view of activism. And it's very interesting because although you need a lot of women in the technological spaces, you have to open them from the citizens side. And we have to continue to fight to increase the number of women as professors and more students of disadvantaged groups, for instance, single moms, young mothers that can never, can never have access to this type of information. So what's this and how can we generate spaces to include these women, for instance, with uh, social um, assistance. Tamara. Tamara from Argentina says, uh, thank you for the presentation, Javier. Can we think of regulatory frameworks at a regional uh, level to approach this? Yes, it would be ideal. The, European Union has, for instance, trustworthiness, they have reliable algorithms, and the, for instance, Maria Paz Hermosilla in the university. There's a university in Chile that has uh, there. Well, there are several universities that uh, have similar names. I forgot it. But, uh, um, and there are processes that enable you to have good ideas. And we may replicate this in Argentina, for instance, fiscalization and surveillance of algorithms. And that would be very interesting because basically the governments are going to copy the algorithms. So let's copy the way we uh, uh, surveil them. And the question about legal IT, whether there should be government agencies that could an impact on the data. Yes, at the university we have an ethics committee, so there, in the same way there should be somebody in uh, governments so that may intervene and stop or promote the uh, creation of large organization of data. At least there should be a national committee. So we have one in Costa Rica in several countries, but they need to have an ethic component, not just opening. So. Now we move to uh, surveil and to monitor to what's happening with data. So especially with uh, the applied, the implementation of the data. We have 
a last comment. We have to define clearly the objectives when designing that data gathering and discussing the different Va a abrir un dato cuando uno abre un set de datos. Hay que tener una conversación de, ok, ¿cómo los voy a recolectar? ¿Cuál va a ser mi metodología? So we have to define how we're going to collect data. How the ethics commission does at university, what is the methodology, what is the reason, what is the hypothesis, what do I wish to achieve with this data? And only then consider all the prejudices that these data might have, what the impact will be, and how we're going to communicate the things through the narrative, how we're going to reflect that society. Great. So for the time being, there are no further comments or questions. Clary, no sé si dejamos unos segundos para ver si se anima. Clary, shall we wait a couple of seconds to see if there are any more questions for Javiera? So, try to make the most of this opportunity. Well, obviously, I have to correct the two or three typos you have in the presentation, and I'll send it once again, and you can share it with everyone else. I think there's a further question there. Would like to read it out? Yes. I like it very much that in this way, I can realize that in the field of technology, not everything is about code, that there are more fields because it's very difficult not to see everything as if it were a product. So it fills me with hope to see that through data, you can really seek to humanize things. Yes, precisely. It's great, a great comment. Big data, all this will not lead us to be a more fair society. So if you like what I'm telling you, believe me that I just communicate what I see is happening in civil society. Look at the civil society that is closest to you, where you can feel most, most at ease and participate because maybe all the experience in the field of code might serve as inspiration for others to participate actively. So we have to attract people to this world. But thank you for your comment. There's one more comment. How do you view the future of the data society of the wealthy compared to the data society of the poor? How do you view the future? How certain is it? I see a society of wealthy free from data because privacy is without doubt a luxury. Well, she says she got lost. <laughs> so where is the question? She got lost. So let me go back. The right not to get data from you collected, for example, bank data only exists when you have a bank account in Switzerland. So the reality is that data is extracted from the poorest and nothing will be known about the wealthiest because privacy will become like Menos acceso a tu información personal y confidencial o tu información social. You have a chance to be more and more private. So people will have less, less access to your private information. And this is happening at this level of schools. It's very difficult to get information about the data from private schools because data perfection protection in private schools is very, very high, but in the public schools, that's quite different. We know what jobs the parents have, who eats at school, who can pay for having lunch at school. We know how many relatives are in prison, for example. So all this creates a map that tells you, well, this school is not so good because the neighborhood is not that good. And this sort of makes me so angry. I really hate it. I get mad at this. In England, you have three levels of schools, outstanding schools, good, 
the water, okay. And then you have the inadequate school. Inadequate is a term they use. So if you look at the map and you look at the houses when you wish to buy or rent a house, then you have information on the school quality and the language used to rate the schools is the word, for example, inadequate. So you think that all the people who go to that school, all the children from those families have hashtag inadequate. So they're going to carry that label around for the rest of their lives. But you don't know if the school of wealthy people are inadequate or not in terms of the people who go there, because that is super protected. But information on public schools is something that is known. So I think there will not be a gap between the wealthy and the poor, but there will be a gap between privacy and public, uh, public data. Thank you, Javier. We have a request from Augusto Maturin. Could you give us contact details if we, in case we might wish to contact you in the future? My data are not very private. If you look up my names, you will find So she mentioned her email address, which it would be great if this could be included in the chat. Thank you, Javiera. Any more questions? Javiera, thank you very much. And to close, uh, thank you for everyone. To everyone, I'd like to ask you to briefly tell us and considering the main topic and the different reflections that we could make of the past hours, which do you consider are the main challenges that societies face in the current situation and the three capacities that we should develop at all levels or which we should aim at. So let's start with the capacities. Understanding the origin of data, to be aware that some data come from non-official agencies and could contain a virus, then being able to understand graphs and when the graphs have been manipulated, namely to be able to read the graphs. And from the standpoint of those who provide information with data is to tell the story behind the data to make these understandable. In other words, infographs, infography containing additional information or that explains that those who don't have the capacity to understand raw data or the mega graph could then establish a relationship between it is explaining and what you really expect to happen. So being able to read information and to communicate information effectively, that's the first step. And that there should be transparency when I communicate information. This should be very clear. We have to quote the source, the methodology followed, who, where was the information of brain obtained from? And then when this is communicated, people at least should have some kind of tra basic training to be able to read these graphs. I think we have to start from there. And what was the other question? Yes, regarding the challenges society faces not only at present times, but also looking into the future and if the current trends will continue. Well, first of all, including in the curricula from primary school through to university, to view things from 
sino que human rights not only regarding research methods whether to collect things in one or the other way but to explain how this is narrated how the history of latin america is explained to use mathematics so that people understand more about statistics this has to do with the curriculum and then i would suggest starting creating data agencies that allows to check what is done in the public and the private sector and also to stop information abuse or the undiscriminated use of data by the big platforms. And then those spaces where decisions are made to pay attention to those who are left out of the conversation. So when the discussion is on public policies, people who never have a voice and a vote regarding public policy the process of dialogue is also a very important point when these public policies are defined. So if people don't really understand what they're speaking about, then those who deliver information should do this in a clear and transparent way so that this can be understood by people who really are illiterate in data interpretation. So thank you very much, Javiera. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to participate in this webinar. And thank you very much to everyone who participated. The contact details are in the chat. So we're saying goodbye. Thank you very much, Javiera for joining us today. Thank you very much, everyone.